in a long career in which he has established his own particular place in British entertainment. He's been described as everything from an angry dowager to a wasp with adenoids. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Can we just establish a rapport or lack of it between you and uh, Kevin, first of all? Did you, have, <laughs> did you ever play soccer? I was forced to. I, I avoided it at school like the plague. <laughs> but, uh, I always had a horror of any kind of fisticuffs, any kind of rough. Uh, <laughs> And so I avoided having to play, but in the army they forced it on me. Did they? Yeah. You had to play it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got to be a man. Oh, yes. All that stuff. And I was shoved out there, and one boot got into contact with this nose, and I had a very good. No, I did. I had. <laughs> I, I, I very, it was a patrician. Patrician. A patrician nose. And now it's all been bonked sideways, you see. Mm. And I've been in trouble ever since with this. Of course, yeah. as you know, mm. sinus operations galore. Mm. And the passages were completely blocked at one point. And I had to, do, I had to do everything through the mouth, you see, which dries up the throat and ruins all your vocal effects. So I have no great love for it. It is a rough game, mm. and people are very rough in it. And it seems to exist. Of roughness in the people who support it, doesn't it? Do not find that. Um, I, I don't think uh, you can blame the footballers for the violence on the pitch. Uh, no, but it, uh, there's, there must be something in the game that brings it out. I, th I think it's quite honestly. I think it's lack of education. Yes, indeed. I think it's just that the football pitch is used as a little bit of a battleground for it. Yes, precisely. But but also, um, don't you think maybe it's where young kids don't have somewhere to get out of aggression, and that's the only place for it? I think that's a little lot to it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Where, you what, they need somewhere to where they can punch a bag or something. It's got a mill wall. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you enjoying working with this young lady? Because, yes. because you're a veteran on the stage and she's just starting. Yeah, tell me something. Don't make me sound too old. Um, <laughs> no, I did have apprehension, I must admit. Quite frankly, I had great apprehension about her because I'd seen her on the films and the telly and all that. And I thought, oh, will she be able to handle these scenes? Because they're scenes which need a lot of handling. They <laughs> an awful lot of precision. And then when it came to actually rehearsing with her, I was staggered. I was staggered by her dedication and her diligence, which is something, you know, you don't often find in the theatre. A lot of people go around thinking that because somebody's labelled actor, or they are, by nature, people who are good at learning lines and doing everything. Uh, you know, to set formula as they should do it every night. But in actual fact, they're not. A lot of people with brass plates outside their door saying, Doctor, a rotten doctor's on there. <laughs> they're always being taken in by these labels, you know, a pedestrian and motorist. And when the man gets out of his car, presumably becomes a, a widow. It's all rubbish, isn't it, these labels? What we have to go by is those that we know. And you can only do that when you've been in a company and known somebody for an awful long time. And that's why it's a very little thing in the commercial theatre. It's a very little thing for a commercial management. And this one has mounted a cast, which is an intriguing one. It's a very good one for the, for the posters and all the rest of it. And they found the right amalgam, you know, to make a cast. And it's gelled because we've all worked together very, very well. And Rain has become very much part of the team, haven't you? Mm, no, it is. It's essentially it's an ensemble. Fun. It's an ensemble piece, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. the whole thing is like everybody. The, everyone everybody gets a chance, you see. Anyone does it, like anyone lets it, the whole thing lets down, doesn't it? That's everyone right. Got a pull together. That's right, it's like a chamber ensemble. Every instrument must work according to, you know, its cue and its plan. It's difficult to, to hear the two of you talking now, you see, to understand that you're both cockneys. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I, I give it away sometimes. I start lifting the phone, very grand. I go, hello. And then it's a friend. I say, oh, it's you. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> and it all goes haywire, doesn't it? People that really know you always can tell, you know, a mile off, you know, they can yeah. say. A mile old man, you from our man, you remember Terrace, a mile Before he was after, before he was before he was there, he was a van boy on the LMS. He used to call it a hell of a mess. That was around. <laughs> and uh, he used to say to you, Don't try that plummy voice stuff with me, mate. Don't try that plummy voice with me. And he hated the theatre anyway. It's all pains, is and oars, that's all they are. <laughs> Don't you start that. Get a trade boy. You have a trade boy. He's always on to me. Like, have a trade. And of course, it's important to remember that anyone that grew up in that period, my father's period, knew poverty. Because the nice 30s, you know, were very poverty stricken. Mm -hmm. And we're probably approaching something, something like ourselves, this recession, you know? And so there was very much this fear of not being able to hold down a job, having money. And he regarded the theatre as totally unstable, mm. as a profession, you know, economically. Mm. And of course, in that sense, you know, for a lot of actors, that's true. But then, of course, you, when you went into acting, I mean, did you make a conscious decision to, to change your voice? You had to, I suppose, because in those days, Cockney, a uh, Cockney accent was totally uh, unwanted in the theatre, wasn't it? Mm, yes. No, I never made a conscious decision to enter the theatre. I mean, I was playing things at school, you know. I was an enormous success at school in school plays. 
And I kept all the notices, or marvellous notices. <laughs> the taste of them all into books, you see. And uh, so I knew I could act. I mean, well, that was a gift, quite natural. I went on. I was, I was showing off, I suppose, but I was doing it with a degree of expertise, which obviously pleased, pleased everybody. I quite enjoyed it, you know. <laughs> and so I knew I could do that. What I didn't know was that there was an awful lot of technique involved, because uh, later on in life you learn about the complexities of a job. Initially you do what, what is that marvellous man Pope says? Fly to altars there, they'll talk you dead. Fools rush in where angels fear. To tread. And of course, I was rushing in as a fool. And it was only much later Very on much that I learned. No, it was much later on that I learned through friends who said to me, You do realise that passage really is saying this. And suddenly I was being told the sense of lines. Before I was just reading them off, thinking I was doing it with a degree of panache. I was half around getting them all wrong. In one play, a Bernard Shaw piece, Man of Destiny, I had to say, Oh, you're not moved by action and victory, gorged by night and day. And I said, Oh, you're not moved by victory and actory. <laughs> but I kept going, you know, and I kept going. And people said, oh, you do know what that passage means. I wasn't studying properly, you know what I mean? Yes. But it was all fools rush in stuff. Later on, of course, a good friend takes you aside and says, look, that's a mistake you're making there. I can tell you what to do. And you put it right. But of course, people, um, I suppose because you've had this long association with carry-on films and, and with uh, your radio um, work and all this sort of thing, would find it difficult to believe that, in fact, you had a strictly classical grounding in the theatre, didn't you? Yes, well, I was doing weekly rep initially, hmm. a lot of the time, and then I found a very, very good rep with Clifford Evans in Swansea, and there's marvellous people there to play with. Uh, Richard Burton opened the season for it. He was playing Constant in the Seagull. Rachel Ross was in that company too. She was marvellous in the uh, production he did of Crim Personnel. She played this uh, rebel, this sort of a leader of revolutionaries, very a manic sort of uh, rebel she played, and I had a scene with her, and she taught me an awful lot, Rachel. She's a very fine, dramatic actress. And I was understudying Burton really? in that company. He was playing Constantine, and I was understudying that role. But I never bothered to learn it, because I thought, well, he's as strong as an ox. He'll never, <laughs> he'll never be off. And one day I came, it was a matinee, and the stage door he said, you better get up there and get that costume on, he's off. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> off? What do you mean? <laughs> I flew up the stairs to his dressing room, and he was lying there, green. And apparently he'd eaten something. It was tomain poisoning, or something in a can. And I said, you, you're going on, aren't you? You're not really ill. And he said, no, I can't. I, can't. I was lying back down. I said, I have to go on. I said, I have to go on. I said, what do you mean I'll have to go on? You're the other study. You can do it. I said, no, I've never learned it. <laughs> and he said, are you gagging? I said, no, I'm not. I've never learned it. I thought you were strong. I thought you'd always go on. I don't know a line. I said, what I'll do, you go on and I'll give you my salary. <laughs> He said, how much did you get? I said, seven quid. <laughs> Wouldn't cover my expenses. That's what he said, because he was a film star. He came to us from films. Mm -hmm. So uh, he eventually agreed, because I did plead with him on my bended knees to go on, and he did. And I never, never actually had a play. All I'd done in the play was to be the cook who had to say, think no evil of us. And I used to do that every night, I thought. You know, I used to vary it. Think no evil of us. Think no evil. You know, get, get a while of and that's what I did, and also then and I had a lot, of, a lot of interesting grinding because, you see, before that I was in a rep where we used to do one-night stands in all kinds of odd places, because they hadn't got enough uh, of an audience in the small town to run it for the whole week, so we used to play one-night stands elsewhere, and we played uh, an asylum called Tone Vale, which is the largest in the West Country, a huge... An asylum? Yes, yeah. huge yeah. Uh, institution for mentally uh, handicapped people. And um, I was on, starting the play off, laying the plot, really, and in the middle of this speech of mine, I had to say something about all together, we're all together, we're all together. And uh, we, I meant, apropos of the play, we were all together in this action. But I said this line all together, and the audience rose as one man and sang Rock of Ages, Cliff. <laughs> 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 and there was this, uh, this, uh, this doctor, this doctor was in the wings saying, keep going, keep going, keep going, we're all, we're all together, and I was doing this. I came off and I said, what on earth happened there? They all sang this entire hymn. The whole play was held up. They all stood and sang. And he said, well, you know, we use this hall for the church service, and you do look rather like the vicar. And, uh, <laughs> when, you, when you said all together, they thought that was it. And, oh, <laughs> and they all started it. Was the, was the um, transfer, if you like, from being <clears throat> a legitimate actor uh, to playing comedy, was that something that you plotted, or was that, in fact, a mistake? Well, that was. Yes, it was all an accident. I was playing in St. Joan. I was playing the Dauphin. I think some people prefer to say Dauphin. But anyway, that was the part I was playing. And 
seen by Orson Welles, and they asked me to be in his production of Moby Dick. And it was also seen by a BBC producer, who was impressed by the fact that I'd gone from the young king, who should begin as, as a bit of fire, as, as young, and go to Louis as an old man in the epilogue. And in the epilogue, I played it very old, you know. I went very old in the epilogue, and very old indeed. And he said he was very impressed by this vocal change and offered me a role in Hancock's Half Hour. <laughs> I, had this, I had to play this old fart that uh, had, this, <laughs> had this enormous home and Hancock had to come in and take it over. And I had to be outraged with the way he treated my furniture and say, there's jelly all over my Rembrandt. <laughs> Which was all fine for sound radio, don't forget. For sound radio, no makeup, you see. So your vocal characterization was all that mattered. So I got that from St. Joan, which is highly unlikely, is it? Very unlikely, absolutely. And then I got the nine parts he offered me in Moby Dick. I was playing the old boy that threatens, you know, the curses and execrations on them when they're going to get on the ship, the pay quad, when they leave Nantucket. I was playing a bit of the I was playing the lookout, I was doing all that. She blows! Oh, great white spout! She blows! Oh, that voice. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 oh, that is great white spout. It's all about sperm whales. You know. <laughs> Awful rubbish. Like, on and on and on. And so I was given a very interesting um, entree into a quite different kind of theatre because he produced an open stage with no set, don't forget, no set at all. We had to go on and do it and then stand in the wings and freeze because there was no set at all. And then uh, the man that did the movement, because Orson wanted it all to be nautical, thoroughly nautical, we were supposed to be on a ship so we had to sway. We were all <laughs> swaying about as if we were drunk with the sea. And the man that was doing all the swaying and the movement was Billy Chappell and he said, I'd like you to be in this musical I'm doing, a Sandy Wilson show. So that led into that, you see. Mm. I did a, a, a musical about a boy who ran a newspaper, a sort of, you know, balmy, juvenile new statesman thing. And I did that. And the audition was ludicrous because they said, you've got to sing this song, which was, I'm your pal, just your pal. And it should have been a little boy going, I'm your pal, just your pal. And remember the day it was strictly in it. Okay, well, that sort of. So voices, you see, well, I went on to sing, and I did, I'm your pal, just your pal, and remember that it must be strictly a tonic pal. <laughs> Rubbish, you see, and they said, oh, no, that's quite wrong. You'll be in short trousers, you know. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in short trousers. So try to make it boyish. I'm your pal, just your pal. And it was terrible to get out there, because I'm that age of a baritone. I mean, I'm the natural baritone. I can't do anything in the tenor range, let alone soprano. I mean, sellers can you right up, so can Harry Seacom. Right up to soprano range. They've got a most incredible range vocally. I haven't. I, I, mean, I can do everything in the baritone range, but nothing else. So it was a dreadful job. So I had to just go on and cut it. You know, and, and talk, sing, as opposed to really sing, which I can't sing at all. Hmm. Does it, does it bother you now that because you have had this long association, again, with, with uh, comedy, with the films and all that, and radio, that a, the, a great number of your fans, there's a barrier, in fact, between them and accepting you as, as a serious actor? No, I don't think there is. I really don't think there is. I mean, if you go and do something... I mean, I had to do, in fact, friend, a play which was... That was The Globe. It was a play where you were comedy throughout, but you had to. There were lots of undertones where you had to establish a terribly lonely uh, character who was and knew at the end of the play that he was utterly bereft of real friends. He was totally alone because of his own bitchiness, his nastiness, and that sort of wit which does alienate people eventually. It's fun for the time, but people all gradually go away, mm -hmm. and you are left alone. And you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to establish that kind of scene and play the sadness of it and hope it if they only came for fun. I think what they're, they're coming for is to be beguiled, to be, I think what Shaw says about theatre is the most significant, uh, to illuminate the dark places of the mind. And I think if you engage them in that process, then they will accept it. They'll accept it totally, whatever the picture you're creating, because you're engaging them. I think the moment that you're just failing, whether it's comedy or tragedy, and really they're only, they're only the two sides of the same coin, the moment you're failing is when they are not engaged by you. Yes. And that means you're not being vulnerable anymore. Vulnerability is what acting's about. You go onto a stage and you say, well, this is it. If you don't like, this is my baby. I've done this. I'm doing this for you. If they don't like it, and, and you're not prepared to be vulnerable, then it doesn't work at all. It doesn't work, and it never will work. But if you are prepared to be vulnerable, I, they're prepared to come with you. And there is that reciprocity established. They'll, they'll come with you halfway. And they'll say, well, is it any good? And go with you. If it's not, and you're not prepared to be engaging, then it's death. And I know actors that have been vulnerable that feel afterwards, you know, having put a hand it's been spat on. They feel, oh, for the rest of their life, they're not going to do it. Yes. You know what I mean? They're going to hold themselves like that. And it doesn't work. You've got to go on putting it out. 
And it's a terrible risk you take, but you take it. You take it nightly. Well, you'll be, yes, and you know, you've been doing it for, for a while now, haven't you, in, yes. in all kinds of, of conditions. You're going to do it again when you bring this plane to the West End. You're going to go through a first night. Now, yes. how much of an ordeal is that for you? Do you? Does it lose its magic the more first nights you do, or do you still feel the same? No, the, the first night is a frisson, runs through everything. Yes, there's an awful sort of uh, tremor and uh, feeling of uh, envy inside a great void and you think oh will the atmosphere be right because doing a show is always dependent on atmosphere and i do believe that every audience contains a certain element that will lead you know they're they're the responsive ones the most responsive ones the most uninhibited ones and they will lead and and then the laughter is infectious and so of course is the other thing a moving moment that also will infect them if it's done rightly and I think if it's all right and it's all gelling, and you know from the moment that curtain goes up whether it is or not, then you can say through it. Another night you think, oh no, they're being very sticky indeed, and there will be one over, they've got to be wooed. And it's not something I enjoy doing, you know, and I feel when I'm not going well. I feel like at a party if I go in and say, hello, and I go, oh, the mum's rush, I think, oh dear. <laughs> I feel like going home, you know. <laughs> of course you can't, of course, yeah. You've got to go off. What about reviews? The reviews mean, I loved, I loved doing them, you, yes. No, 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 sorry, I meant being reviewed. Oh, reviews? Yes, oh, critics. The inevitable oh, consequence. yes, critics, yes. <laughs> the inevitable consequence of a first night is that you're going to get, you're going to get either panned or, or praised or yes. somewhere in between. Yes, well, well one does look, look to them with apprehension. Yes, of course one does, because so often people do read them and are influenced by them. And, uh, what was the worst time you've had from the critics? The worst play that you did? That oh, the autumn, had? unquestionably. Yes, really? they oh. loathed me in it. Yes. Yes, they loathed me in it. And of course, it was the wrong time for the play. The climate of opinion was quite wrong in '65. It was later mounted. That whole play that I did, Loot by Autumn, uh, was later mounted in 1970. Five years later, and had a quite different reception. In a totally different climate of opinion, mm. prevailed. But the time we were didn't. It didn't work at all. They didn't like me in it. It wasn't the image they'd come to expect. And I didn't pull it off. And the censure that I received was, I think, deserved. Yes, mm -hmm. it was reasonable. I had a marvellous time in it, though, because I met Orton, and he was great, great fun. Was marvellous fun to be. I never met him. It was terribly, I mean, terribly funny. That's why I always find it so silly when people talk about Orton as, as you know, somebody with dark undertones yes. and blackness, whereas he was great fun. And they used to play marvellous jokes. He used to write to the newspapers as Edna Wellthorpe. He used to write all these daft letters to the newspapers. And he wrote to the manager of the Ritz Hotel. Uh, I saw the letters. He used to keep copies of everything. And he wrote to Edna Wellthorpe and said, I came to your opulent establishment for tea. I was very impressed. Now, I was with Mrs. Sullivan. You'll remember her. She was the one in the fur coat. <laughs> and I think that's terribly funny to the manager of the Ritz Hotel. And he said she left behind a handbag which contained a boots folder with photographs of her and myself in risque poses. <laughs> and, um, also a pair of, pair of gloves made of sticky vegetable matter, and we would like very much to have it returned. And he got a letter back saying, no such bag has been found, an exhaustive search by our staff has failed to reveal any bag or any photographs of you and Mrs. Sullivan, but showing you about good attention at all times. And he wouldn't let it drop. He went on with it and said, I know you've got them there. I know you're looking at those photographs. You're getting a thrill, a cheap voyeur. And it was an incredible attack. And he wrote to the vicar of his local church and said, would you lend us the hall? As Edna Wellthorpe. I'm, I am secretary of the Spectre Players, pretending he was a group, the secretary of a drama group. And we wish to mount this play, which is a wonderful plea for tolerance in homosexuality, and it's called Nelson Nance. <laughs> We'd love to have the church hall. Would you? I, we were sure that your attitude with the church would be very tolerant, and we'd, you'd lend us the church hall for nothing for our production. He got a reply from the vicar saying, "No, on the contrary, we're not lending the hall for that purpose." And I think lampooning a national hero is appalling. He so thought setting up Nelson was dreadful, you see. So he wrote again. There's Mrs. Wellthorpe saying, "Edna's died. Doubtless she read of her demise in the local paper, and I've taken over her work. I found in a cupboard under the stairs all her letters about the." Spectrum and her wonderful production, Nelson was an ants, and it went on all <laughs> over again. And got another reply from the vicar saying it was a poor to read of the death of Edna. And he wrote to Crows and Blackwell saying that the, your, your black fruit, fruit pie filling has laid my aunt Lydia low. She's <laughs> she, she, is, she is languishing on a day bed and been up, been up half the night. And what dreadful things, suggestions of terrible diarrhea. And, and, um, and saying, you say glucomates have been added. Yes, and what else I'd like to know? 
it was a terribly funny letter, and he got crates of it from Crosby Black. Was saying you must have got a rotten back. You know, they sent crates of it to him. It sounds like, splendid. Oh, it was a riot. Yeah. I tell you what, what, talking. I'm cheeky. I'm talking of diarrhoea of all things. Excuse me. Oh, yes. But we had like when we was at Greenwich, there was one night when I just couldn't do the show. Right? That's right. Yes, yeah, because she couldn't I do had the show. to do something else. It had been planned beforehand. There was no way I could get out of it. So they had the, the little lady, lovely girl, Sarah, to do my bit, you see. So the next day I was a bit worried, because she's like, done, I've been to acting school and that, and I came up and I said, you know, how did it go? Was, what, what, what did she do it like? Was it all right? And she said, oh, wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. Quite a different conception of the whole thing. Wonderful. He said, but there was a lot of people come up to me afterwards and said, I bought my chips, I meant to see Lorraine. Where was she? There are loads of people asking. Where's Lorraine Chase? Where's Lorraine Chase? <laughs> this is the punchline. I suppose she was. This is, she's... She had a terrible diarrhea. Terrible diarrhea. <laughs> Isn't that dreadful? It's a very kind thing to do, isn't it? It's a very kind thing. It's very kind thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then he dies. <laughs> then they won't ask their money back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because you're afflicted, you see. Yeah. 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 Isn't that cruel? I didn't think oh, you were. Oh, he said she's I found you an alibi, darling. <laughs> Now, sir, I would like you to. I remember I saw uh, this sort of struck me when I, uh, we saw Mr. Lamar there giving out with all the French. But I remember seeing a show that you did with uh, Terry Hughes here, one man show, I think it was, about seven years ago or more, in which you impersonated, if that be the word, a French singer. Oh, yes, yes, I did. Yes. It's a long time ago. Yes. <clears throat> but I wondered if you might revive the. Uh, the moment for us. Oh, I never remember the lines. I never remember the lines. Oh, God. Oh, God. I never, honestly, it, it, it's very, very funny. Um, do, do you remember the one I'm talking about? Yes, all right. What? Yes. yes, it's called Crepe Suzette. Crepe Suzette. Yes. Do you really want me to do it? I do, sir. Yes, yes. There is a very lame, it'll be a very lame version. Oh, I doubt it. Years ago, it's years ago. You're talking about 1970. 1970, how long ago is that? Yeah. You've not changed her hair. No, oh, you're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stoneham and his assembly await you over there, sir. Right. Well, well vous avez le plaisir. Vous avez, vous avez le suggesté. Pas moi. Mm. <laughs> you heard all that, did you? Mm. Mm. I have to get up very slowly, otherwise you, you ruin the camera. It's, um, <laughs> it's a song, une chanson d'amour, which has the virtue of containing all words we use every day in our own language. So it's not at all difficult to follow. And uh, it was written by Derek Collier, and the music was inspired by my friend, the eminent actor and uh, musicologist, Mr. Gordon Jackson. And it's arranged for us tonight by Harry Stoneham. It's usually introduced in the French tradition. They say, my next uh, number is a song of love. <laughs> it's uh, about uh, people who are, you say, crossed in love. Uh, he loved her and uh, she loved him. But they cannot be uh, married because they are, how you say, husband and wife. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Entitled uh, Marcret Suzette, which means a flaming hot dish. <laughs> <laughs> and so is Suzette. <laughs> Ensemble, l'on y est. 
lingerie euh, de toilette <rire> gauloise cigarette entourage ma prépsée citron mirage carvet Dove, Brute et Chanel <rire> Chaise Lange, Sacha Dessèle Fuselage, ma prépsusée Hans Ney, Bidet Commissionnaire Mon repos, Brigitte Bardot je sens frontière. C'est un nord Le French a mis dans ça. Oh, espionnage, grillère, camembert, fromage, mayonnaise, all night, garage. Oh, thanks, Amen. It would be futile to try and uh, follow it. But, uh, it really was super. Nice. Minor classic, actually. Well, as long as they understand that it was uh, on the spot. You know, I'm not a professional singer. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Remains me just to thank my guests, Kevin Keegan, uh, Lorraine, and uh, Kenneth. Wish the two of you, as well, great success with the thank show you very much. to West End. A reminder to you that uh, my next show is on Wednesday. My guests will be Billy Connolly and Warren Mitchell. Until Wednesday night, from all of us here. Good night.